welcome to another episode of the Middle East News Hour. We have a packed, or I have a packed uh, show for you today. Um, really big, important things happening in uh, the Middle East this week. Most importantly, uh, for the past two weeks, we've had uh, nationwide protests in Iran. And so I'm going to be uh, joined in just a few minutes with, by a really important guest, really a really special guest, Ahmed Obali. Ahmed Obali is the founder and director of Gunas TV, which is an Azerbaijani uh, language television station, satellite television station that broadcasts out of the United States into Iran, um, the countries of the Middle East and Europe. And it broadcasts, it started, he's founded in 2004 and he broadcasts seven or eight hours uh, a day. It's actually in a loop 24 seven of Azeri language programming, news, uh, culture, um, and other shows uh, to the Azeri, Azer, or Azerbaijani, Iranian uh, population, 30 million people. It's the largest non-Persian ethnic group in Iran. Um, and the Azerbaijanis are also very active in the uh, protests now and have been for the past two weeks. So we talked about both what the protests are about, their prospects for actually overturning the regime, what has to happen for them to do that. Uh, and we'll also be talking about um, we'll also be talking about what what the outside world can and should be doing uh, to to fix them. So that's uh, coming up. But first, I just wanted to give a couple of uh, remarks about what's happening in in Israel this week um, because we've had uh, some really really distressing uh, developments here in Israel. The first thing is that the head of the Central Elections Committee. Uh, Supreme Court justice. Yeah, we have we have we have a great uh, division of uh, of, uh, of uh, power and checks and balances in our in our government that the Supreme Court justices are in charge of the elections to the Knesset. But at any rate, uh, 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 the justice uh, now in charge of the Central Elections Commission is one known particularly, which is interesting for his radical left wing political views. When this is funny because he's actually distinguished himself from his other Supreme Court uh, colleagues on the bench who are almost uniformly to the left, but he's to the far left. And so he's now in charge of our elections. And he decided to uh, bar a member of Knesset or former member of Knesset, Michai Shikli, from running um, under really trumped up uh, uh, excuses and justifications. Uh, Shikli, if you recall, he was on the show in December. And um, he was the only member of the Yamina uh, party, uh, Naftali Bennett and Nayela Shaked's party that didn't betray Yamina's voters and joined the uh, government that Bennett and Shaked formed with the left, the far left and the Muslim Brotherhood party. Um, so for his efforts, uh, they tried to ban him from running for uh, Knesset with any of the uh, lists, first and foremost, Likud that was already represented in the current or now outgoing Knesset. Uh, to block him from being able to run again, to punish him for actually not betraying the faith of voters. Um, and he, he sued them in Jerusalem District Court. And uh, at the urging of the court itself, the Knesset made a deal with him that if he quit the Knesset, if he resigned uh, right away, that he would be allowed to run for Knesset in, in any of the lists. Um, and so uh, that's what he did. And uh, Amit just ignored completely the deal that the district court had overseen and decided that anyway, uh, Shikli can't run. Uh, so that that was one thing that he did. And this was just a bold faced political move uh, by a judge pretending to be speaking in the rule of law in the name of the law, but actually was completely ignoring it. He was ignoring the law and the district court judgment, uh, both in one in one decision. So that was a perversion of, of democracy on the part of the guy who's supposed to be overseeing our elections, which is really unpleasant. And the same day, Wednesday, that he did that, uh, Yesha Teed, uh, chairman and uh, caretaker, prime minister, Yair Lapid, uh, decided to petition uh, uh, Amit's uh, commission and uh, ask them to shut down Channel 14. Yes, the acting prime minister, the caretaker prime minister, uh, decided uh, that the best thing to do right now uh, it, on the eve or a month away from the elections to shut down a television station in Israel. And why do you ask? You, did he decide that uh, Channel 14 has to be shut down? Well, it has to be shut down because uh, Channel 14 is a new station. It launched last December. And obviously, it's, well, not obviously, but it's also personal for me because I serve as the channel's diplomatic commentator. But um, 
Uh, Channel 14 launched in December, and it's the Israeli Fox News, although with a fraction of uh, Fox News's budget, all the same. Um, it's the first time in Israeli history, in Israeli television history, that we have a station that it has an outlook that is in lockstep with the left on all issues, including hating Netanyahu and supporting the left and the legal fraternity, which is the left, on all issues all the time, 24-7. So for that, uh, Lapid has described Channel 14 as a propaganda arm of the Likud. Yep. Uh, because it doesn't support him uh, the same slobbering way that Channel 11, 12, and 13 do, Channel 14 is a propaganda organ. And the problem is, is that given what Amit just did to Chikli, there's every reason to fear that they may actually close the station. And if they do that, then its broadcast license will be uh, will be revoked and uh, Channel 14 will be no more. We'll go the same way that Arut Sheva went in 1996 when Shulamin Aloni, I think, petitioned the court to shut it down. And uh, the way that Israel Iom almost went uh, when a law was uh, a bill was uh, was passed in a in a preliminary reading in the Knesset uh, that would have forced the closure of the daily newspaper, the largest circulation newspaper in Israel, because it didn't at that time. Now it does, but it didn't uh, toe the party line of the left uh, in terms of hating Netanyahu and loving. Uh, loving our legal fraternity, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, you know, loving the Palestinians and hating Jews who live in Judea and Samaria. At any rate, uh, so that uh, is all that stuff. Great stuff happened this week. Also, you should look at my column in uh, JNS that came out on uh, Thursday about how Benny Gantz and his advisor, former Air Force uh, uh, commander, Amir Eshel, um, subverted and uh, undermined uh, Netanyahu and Trump, by the way, uh, a peace plan between Israel and the Palestinians by convincing Jared Kushner that uh, uh, that Israel mustn't be allowed, that Netanyahu mustn't be allowed to apply Israeli law to Judea, to areas of Judea and Samaria designated in the Trump uh, peace plan as, as he had planned to do at the end of January 2020. Um, so all of that happened uh, this week. Uh, Amir Eshel explained, you know, proudly how he, in complete contempt for the will of the voters and the policies of the elected leader of Israel, the Prime Minister Netanyahu, and by the way, the the uh, wishes of the U.S. President. Um, he didn't. He he thought it would be a bad idea to leave Oslo. He and Gantz, and they were able to force Israel. Uh, to stay within the parameters by convincing Kushner that reality should not be a guide for a policy in relation to Israel and Judea and Samaria. So that was another thing that happened this week. Um, and, and what we're seeing really, what we're seeing with uh, with uh, Yitzhak Amit's decision on Chikli, what we're seeing with Lapid's uh, move against Channel 14, which by the way is meant by silence that is complicity by every single uh, other uh, competing television station with good reason, because despite its shoestring budget, Channel 4 has already surpassed state television Channel 11 in ratings, and it's uh, very quickly moving up on the Channel 13. So they're all quite scared, because as news gets out that we actually have a news station that doesn't insult most Israeli uh, television viewers and actually is a good station, um, uh, people want to watch it, and they're very scared of it. So they're very supportive of shutting down their only competitor. Um, so we're seeing here in the space of a week, we're seeing a perversion of the rule of law by the left. We're seeing an, an attempt that may be successful, God forbid, to uh, shut down freedom of the press in Israel. Uh, that only began in December with the launch of the of, of the of the of the station. Um, and we're seeing uh, on the left uh, the elites, uh, the generals. Uh, uh, General uh, Eshel uh, working for Gantz coming out and proudly describing how he undermined uh, democratic norms of governance uh, by uh, blocking the elected leader of Israel from actually forming and implementing uh, national uh, strategic policy. And, and there was a lot more in that interview that I didn't discuss about Iran that essentially says the same thing on Iran. So we have all this stuff and it's all in the balance because on November 1st, with or without Channel 14, with or without Amichai Shikli on the Likud list, we're going to elections and the next government is going to have to decide what to do about Iran's nuclear weapons program. It's going to have to decide what to do, how do we help the Iranian people to overthrow the regime? Um, and it's going to have to deal with the Palestinian Authority as it all falls apart under the succession struggle uh, as, as Abu Mazen, uh, the chairman of the PLO and the, PLO and the Palestinian Authority is 
uh, moving towards death's door at the age of 87 in the 16th reign of his four year term of office. Um, all of these things and many, many more are going to be determined by the next government. And what the left has shown us just in the last week is that if it is uh, able to form a coalition, then they're going to undermine the rule of law and they're under, going to undermine Israeli uh, freedoms uh, for the right. Uh, at least uh, we're going to have two. We still have. We're going to maintain our dual for a uh, rule of law where there's one law for leftists and Arabs and there's another law for uh, uh, Zionists and, and ultra-Orthodox Jews and uh, never the twain shall meet. Or if we're actually going to curb our legal fraternity and uh, have a separation of powers and, and uh, subordinate our legal fraternity to our elected leadership. Um, and we're going to see whether we have a uh, national interest-based foreign policy or if we have a foreign policy based on appeasement and the concept that Israel's at fault and that we have to you know, just bow down to everybody, including the United States, which, by the way, last thing I'll tell you in this little, in this little uh, uh, lecture is that uh, Israel Iom actually uh, published this week that the uh, Biden administration is already now anonymously, I'm sure that they're going to do it, in their own voice, if God forbid, <laughs> uh, the right wing bloc led by Netanyahu gets an absolute 61 seat majority and is able to form a stable governing coalition. So the Biden administration and a leader of a major American Jewish organization who claims he is not a progressive, said that they're simply not going to be able to accept the legitimacy of an Israeli government that has Itamar ben uh one of the most popular uh, politicians, a uh, uh, foreign uh, far right, a nationalist uh, politician who leads the Otsma UD, uh, the Jewish Power uh, Party, which is one of the two parties that comprise the uh, religious Zionist uh, uh, list. Um, the Otsma UD uh, under uh, Itamar ben -Gvir is a follow-on of Mayor Kahana's Kach party, but he has disavowed the central plank of Kahana's uh, agenda, which is uh, expulsion of Arabs uh, from Israel. He only supports the expulsion of, of terrorists from Israel, which I think the majority of Israeli Jews also support. At any rate, um, so they're saying that a government, obviously a left-wing government that is populated by Arab political parties that support terrorism and reject Israel's right to exist, uh, that's okay, that's fine. They'll be happy to uh, work with such a government, but a government that has a nationalist party uh, that uh, seeks the, uh, the, the defeat of Israel's enemies well, no, that's that that's illegitimate. Even though it would be based on an absolute majority of Knesset seats, doesn't matter. Uh, as far as the the U.S. government under Biden is concerned, Israelis are not allowed to choose our leaders. So really, they have a lot in common, I guess, with uh, with uh, Justice Amit. Uh, at any rate, these are the stakes that uh, we see that uh, we're called upon to determine uh, on November first, and obviously. Uh, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot on the line. Um, so I think it's very important for us to be aware that it's not just Israel's, Israel's uh, uh, policies regarding Iran, regarding the Palestinians, et cetera, that are under, under, under question that are going to be determined on November 1st, but it's really whether Israel is going to be able to restore its democratic institutions and its rule of law, unitary rule of law. That's the only rule of law there is for all Israeli citizens. Uh, and is going to be able to assert its national interests and advance them in its policies. Uh, all of that hangs in the balance. And of course, uh, my ability to practice my, my profession as a journalist uh, and that of my colleagues is also uh, hanging in the balance here. So uh, that's what's going on. And without further ado, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce all of you to uh, our extraordinary guest for the week, uh, Ahmed Obali. We're really lucky today uh, to have our guest for today's program is Ahmed Obali. Ahmed Obali is uh, originally from Iran. He moved to the United States in 1985. He's from Iranian Azerbaijan in the north. Um, and he actually, um, he started a television station, a satellite TV station that broadcasts into Iran. So not only is he watching very closely what's happening on the ground in Iran today, as you have more and more protests countrywide going on now for going on uh, two weeks. So by the time this probably is uh, recorded and you're watching this, it'll have already been two weeks. Um, not only is he watching it like we are, but he's also an actor because his broadcasts are seen in Iran on the ground. Um, so without further ado, 
Um, Ahmad, uh, it's wonderful to have you on the program. Thank you very much for joining me today. Well, thank you so much for invitation, Caroline. Uh, glad to be here. Now, well, I'd, I'd love it if we could just start our conversation by telling us a little bit about uh, yourself and your work uh, and about specifically about your, your broadcasts into Iran and how that and, and how what your reach is and, and what kind of uh, programming you provide for the people on the ground in Iran. And then we'll move to the protests themselves. Yeah, I am uh, originally from the uh, northern part of the uh, Iran, the country that the at least um, I, I left. I left in 1985. Actually, I was a teenager when I was in when I I left in. Sorry, I came to US in 1985, but I left Iran in 1981. Uh, so as the Iranian so-called Islamic revolution was taking place, I was a teenager going to high school. I was a participant in some of the demonstrations, unfortunately, as I call it now. Uh, and after the revolution, after the Islamic takeover, uh, we became actually the, as they called it, anti-revolutionaries because we didn't like the government's new new policies that they brought on um unlike what they promised uh we realized that the suppression and the lack of freedom lack of democracy is the base of the going to be the base of the government so we became so-called opposition at that time i really didn't know what opposition means we just didn't like the government so i was i was arrested uh stayed in prison for a while and then I was able to escape so spent about a year in the mountainous areas, finally moved to escape to Turkey. And then from there, after four years of, of moving from country to another country, I came to United States in 1985. So as a, a former refugee, as a former um, dissident at least, uh, I, I always wanted to help the cause of, for those that are under pressure, under oppression, uh, daily problems that they face from the government side. So worked, I worked with United Nations Human Rights Commission, special rapporteur on Iran, late uh, the great Maurice Capitorn, uh, reporting on human rights ab abuses in northwest part of Iran, which is populated mostly, not mostly, but by Azerbaijanis, as we call it, South Azerbaijan, to distinct, distinguish, uh, they basically to, to see the difference between North and South. And then uh, there are 30 million of us. So a lot of our compatriots were uh, arrested. And uh, so I, I worked with United Nations, uh, not for them, but with them, and also with Amnesty International, <laughs> Iran division in UK. But in 19, but in 2000, late 2004, I realized that our people need to get to know their rights, freedom, democracy, human rights, ethnic rights, all, all of that. So I set up a, a shoestring, as they call a operation uh, programming, uh, television programs or sending te television programs via satellite to Iran. And uh, we've been on air since uh, late 2004, going to the year uh, 18. So this is a brief uh, uh, and do you, do you broadcast 24-7 or, or is it just a few hours a week or how does that work? No, and our station is 24-7. Um, unfortunately, we cannot really uh, do 24-7 programming. However, we do six to eight hours and then put it on repeat, automatic repeat. So those that live in Iran and they can't see it due to jamming or anything, if they can't see our program, in one segment, at least they have a chance to see it in, within the next, say, 8, 10, 12 hours. Uh, we, our footprint, satellite footprint is the entire Middle East from Northern Africa to Eastern China, uh, to Western China, and the entire Europe. So we are on two satellites, actually three satellites now, and uh, trying to cover as much as possible, but we are not on uh, U.S. Uh, area, we, we're only in the uh, Europe and Middle East. And and is it all news? It's is it all news uh, related to Iran? Is it all? 
it's mostly actually it is some news, some uh, talk shows, discussions. Basically, we're trying to music, uh, some movies, documentaries, but mostly we're uh, concentrating on bringing awareness by any means to the people. Um, so, and what's what's the name of your what's the name of your station again? Gunas TV. Gunas stands Gune for South Azerbaijan. Az for Azerbaijan. That's basically South Azerbaijan TV. Gunas Gunas uh, TV. You know, one of the uh, if we just switch gears for a second. Well, first of all, do you have any idea what your viewership is like in Iran? It's very difficult to to be honest with you. It is extremely almost impossible to get the real numbers as, as you may imagine, it is hard to, to ask questions and get answers, you know, get, uh, we don't have companies that can do a, a real job of finding out who's watching who, but uh, we, estimate, we estimate about 15 million viewership on average per month, but on, but on a daily basis, somewhere between one to one and a half million people. And, and the language is Persian? Is it is The language it is mostly Azerbaijani. It's basically an Azerbaijani television, but we also have some Persian language programs and we also have occasion, at least we had continuously, uh, the coverage for uh, hours for Arabs and Baluch and Turkmens. Uh, but lately we've switched to mostly Azerbaijani, some Persian. So, um, you know, one of the ways that the regime, you know, we, we've seen um, we've seen waves of protests against uh, the regime, against its policies, against its leadership, against uh, its economic uh, its economic failures, its uh, its um, environmental failures with the water uh, supply in Iran, and and many many other things that have brought people to the streets, uh, non-payment of pensions, all sorts of things. Um, and one of the ways that over time the regime has been able to break up protest movements and they considered a threat to their uh, hold on power was by saying, these are separatists, you're being led by the nose, you Persians, if you continue to support the protesters and what you're really supporting is the breakup of Iran. So it's been this sort of, on the one hand, Islamic supremacist, um, uh, theology that guides the policies of the regime, but on the other hand, they've been able to maintain power by uh, Persian jingoism and opposition to, to uh, ethnic groups inside of Iran and, and ginning up fear um, and xenophobia among Persians. So um, what I've heard that, I've heard other people say that the thing that's distinguishing these specific uh, demonstrations from prior demonstrations that we've seen is that um, you don't hear uh, um, you don't hear the Kurds, which is where the uh, protests began because of the brutal murder by, by the regime of uh, Marseille um, um, Alima. Uh, you don't hear anybody calling for Kurdish independence for Iranian Kurdistan or Azerbaijan or other areas of the Baluchis who are also very active in the protest, you hear more uh, common messages of opposition to the regime. Is that also the sense that you have, that you have much more uni unified messaging across Iran or, or, is, or is what I heard incorrect? Yeah, well, uh, Caroline, we, we have to realize that what breaks a country, breaks up a country or keeps the country together is basically the government's own policy. So if the government is, uh, is fair to all its citizens, let's say like Switzerland or Belgium, uh, there is not going to be any ethnic issues. All, if all the ethnic groups have their uh, basic rights, meaning at least education in their mother language, at least their uh, some sort of self-governance, just like let's say in India or, or in Switzerland or in Canada, for instance, then no other country, no other power, even no, no groups within the country can break, the, break up the country. So what has brought up uh, this separatist issue is basically Iranian government's policies in the last 90 years, trying to assimilate all the non-Persians to Persian, 
uh, avoiding uh, or, or banning their languages in schools, history is revision and, and, and so forth. Uh, so therefore, uh, the, uh, to me, the real separatists are the uh, ultra-right or nationalist Persians that deny any smallest right to ethnic groups, Baluchis, Kurds, Arabs, and Azerbaijanis, and Turkmens. Iran is a multi-nation country, multi-ethnic country. There is no single majority in the country that can claim over 50% of the population to be uh, of their own. So even the Persians are minority, even the Persians are not 50%, over 50% population. So the best way would have been to have a united country with all the elements within the country uh, having equal rights. That's not the case. So therefore, as a result of Iran's policy in the last nine years, especially, especially after the Islamic revolution, so-called revolution, uh, now we have a polarized society where Arabs uh, are asking for their rights, Kurds asking for their rights, Baluchis, Azerbaijanis, uh, and we are, uh, we are the largest basically, maybe, maybe even larger than Persian or equal to Persians. We, we, we have about 30 million population. So this is a large number. Uh, so therefore now even not only in this demonstration, even in the past demonstrations, people have, all, the, all these ethnic groups have one common goal, meaning the Islamic regime has to go. Basically, people have come to that conclusion that this regime is not able to reform itself, is not able to have a, uh, to promise a better future economically, politically for the people. Uh, so that's our common goal. The Islamic regime has come to end of its life, sort of. Uh, it cannot uh, reform, the, uh, reform its own uh, economic policies of spending people's money in Hezbollah, Hamas, Houthis, Bashar Assad, Hashtashabi in Iraq, and, and all the terror groups worldwide. So this is a major problem that Iran cannot reform, cannot uh, stop funding, and once while it's keep funding these terror groups, obviously it is people's money that is being spent. In addition to that, you know, as a result of these activities, uh, you know, Iran is faced with sanctions uh, that is hurting ordinary people too. But ordinary people are willing to to go to have the sanctions if it helps the government. The goal. So if it, help, it helps the, to bring the, this government to end of its life. Uh, so in, in these demonstrations, coming back to your question again, we have that common goal among all the groups, but we also have all the groups have their own uh, specific uh, uh, agenda, meaning, you know, in, let's say in our cities, uh, our people are going, they're calling for death to Khamenei, death to the regime, that's, that's good. They're also calling for freedom and uh, justice and local government. Uh, so do the Arabs, so do the Baluchis, so do the Kurds. So of course the Persian uh, centralists don't like this idea, but you know, if they really want to keep the Iranian government country together, they have to give all the rights, equal rights to all the ethnic groups. You know, and all the ethnic groups, have their own land that they live on. It's not like the United States, we are spread all over the country. Like, it's not like this. In Iran, you have Kurdistan that is populated by Kurds. You have Ahwaz that is populated by Arabs. Azerbaijanis so is by Arabs. So basically what you're Turks. saying, but, ju but just to bring it back, so um, what you're saying is that, you know, the thing that unites all of the, all of the different uh, people uh, today is that everybody has basically reached the conclusion that this regime has to go. Um, and um, and, and uh, right now, uh, the, uh, the epicenter of the, of the protests, at least as there as a broadcast to the world, is really um, the, the struggle for women's rights, which is 
in many ways, um, simply by calling for women's rights in Iran, you're essentially saying we need to bring down the entire regime because the regime itself is based upon misogyny. So you can't, you can't actually give women rights under the regime. The, 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 the demands are unmeetable. I mean, you can have various levels of repression, but you can't actually meet the basic demand for equal rights for women uh, when you have a, a regime that, that you know, misogyny basically emanates through its Islamist uh, theological worldview. So it, it's an impossible demand for the regime to meet. Um, and is this something that, you know, you, you feel is resonating with the Azerbaijani Iranians also, or is, or is this uh, um, more provincial to Kurdistan or to, or to uh, Tehran? and other areas that are more the metropolitan centers of the country itself, the Persian, Iran, if you will. Well, I, I think you're right that all the people, all the ethnic groups, including Persians, have long time ago, they have come to this conclusion that the regime has to go. The problem is that the regime doesn't go uh, because there are issues that hasn't been solved. Uh, lack of uh, coordination uh, among, let's say, all the ethnic groups, including Persians, is one problem. Uh, lack of, uh, uh, lack of uh, uh, unification, basically, among uh, not only ethnic groups, but also different segments of society was a problem. But it is, it is being solved, as we see in these demonstrations. Uh, the, uh, the, the, one of the main issues that uh, the government is facing right now Unlike past demonstrations, this is a widespread uh, area. This is started as a woman's right. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, some you know young uh, ladies were killed innocently, uh, and, and that caused these uproar. It it is it has become it has passed that woman's right issue. This has become a nationwide anti-government uh, protests. So you, now we can hardly hear any slogans for women's rights. It doesn't mean that we don't want women's rights. Of course, we all want women to, to be equal to men. Uh, they, have, they should have their right. People have realized that this government will not be able, even if, it, even if some segments of the government would like to, they cannot give women right uh, to the society because it's an ideological government and ideology prevents them from giving, giving in to women. Therefore, this is going to be uh, a, a problem until this government goes away. So women- So that's the real question. Right. Can I just ask you, I'm sorry, um, how concerned do you think that Ayatollah Khamenei and Raisi and all of their advisors and henchmen and the IRGC are when they're looking at these protests. Do you think that they care? Because you know the, the argument has been made by a lot of people that look, you know, they haven't even begun to fight. And you know, what we're seeing now policemen on the ground, some uh, uh, low-level military units, so that you know that we haven't really seen the regime even try to quell these protests and they'll turn Iran into Syria before they give up power. Um, so those are, I guess, two questions that I'm asking you. One is, do you think that, the, that these protests are scaring the regime? Do you think that they're concerned? And um, do you think that it's possible to bring them down given you know, the way, given just how fanatical they are? Well, are, is the government concerned? Yes, very concerned actually. The problem that they have is from the past, uh, let's say, couple, a uh, couple years ago, when they cracked down hard and based on Reuters assessment, there were about 50, at least 1,500 people shot down, uh, shot dead. Sorry. Um, so, and that uh, Iran, uh, Iran doesn't want to repeat uh, that experience again. <clears throat> so they were hoping, they were hoping that. Uh, the uh, protesters uh, will get tired, will go away within a week. They were hoping for the for last Friday as end of demonstration, 
because it's holiday, streets are quiet, not many people come out. Uh, on the contrary, the, the Friday prayers, pro-government people go out and pray, uh, some by force, some willingly. So they were hoping that Friday will end the demonstrations. And they also had the, uh, their own uh, pro-government demonstration after the, after the Friday prayer. That didn't happen. So the, the pro-government demonstration did take place, but it was miserably failed. So few people joined. Uh, you know, in, in, in cities like Tabriz, uh, where we have millions of people living, uh, there were hardly less than 400, hardly 400 people joined pro-government demonstration. This was a miserable failure. But then, uh, of course, it continued on Friday night. This is as we go into day number 13, the uh, government is cracking down. It is not as heavy. It doesn't look as heavy in, as in the past, but uh, we have uh, over 100 people dead. Uh, at least for now, but you know, a lot of people that have been shot dead, uh, uh, we don't know yet, as we know in the past, uh, from the past, uh, after the demonstrations are over, we will know, we will have a better assessment of how many people have been killed. So, and we know thousands of people have been arrested. We know after midnight, the government gets busy going door to door, arresting people, hoping that the uh, uh, so-called, in their view, leaders will be arrested and people will get tired, and that doesn't happen. And I think this, 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 uh, this is a uh, revolution in process. Uh, is this demonstration going to continue and bring the government down? It's really hard to say. I, I don't think so, but, but it is also possible. Uh, if, if it continues, and the strikes take place, the oil workers threaten today that if government continues to crack down on demonstrations, they'll go on a strike. Uh, you know, the, the teachers, the uh, education sector mostly is in, on a strike now. So if the strikes take over the country and more people join in, uh, it is possible that this could bring the government down. But I don't how? think it is that, yet. That's really just... That's really the second question. How, how can they bring down the government when the government has a monopoly on, on weapons and the use of force and, and, and they don't have any problem with, with killing? Um, how, would, how would protests or even strikes, how does that work? Well, we have, we have just not far uh, long ago, we, we have an experience in Egypt, for instance. How did they do it? Uh, people just... Uh, Kept, continue, kept uh, or continued demonstrations. Uh, and finally, the, the army uh, took the people's side. Uh, or the same thing in Tunisia, same thing sort of in, in Libya. Uh, same thing was going to happen in, in Syria had Iran and Russia didn't uh, help on time to, to save Bashar Assad. So, it is possible uh, we, the demonstrators don't have a clear leadership, which uh, some view as, as a uh, minus point, but I think it's a plus point because if there were leaders inside the country and the government arrested them, then that would be end of it. That's not the case. So now we have all these teenagers, young people that don't see any future and they have nothing to go home for. And they, they just want to, be on the street, continue pressing, pressing the government to back down and it, government will, will give in some, but they don't want to give in too much because they are afraid that um, uh, by giving up too much, uh, they, uh, people will ask for even more. Therefore, this, uh, this demonstration is going to continue until, until it is uh, cracked hard and that will backfire on government as well, I think. You know, it's interesting because uh, uh, one of the things that uh, people have remarked on is that these protests are taking place around the same time that the leadership in Iran and the regime are starting to enter into a succession crisis with Khamenei's uh, health failing, 
Um, and, you know, we've had many, many times and reports over the years that he's about to die and he's about to die and he always rebounds. So everything has to be taken with a grain of salt as far as these things are concerned. But, you know, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad's name has come up, Khamenei's son, who I think is 35, thinks that he's supposed to succeed his father. So that you have um, a new sort of a new instability in, within the regime's ranks where you have the leadership ranks of vying and competing with one another to take over power. Um, so perhaps this is sort of an hour of, uh, of grace where it might be possible because they're not unified uh, for something much bigger to, to happen as a result of these protests. And do, do you agree or, or well, how do you view the regime's instability uh, against the backdrop of, of uh, uh, the succession uh, struggle uh, uh, playing into the protests and, and the regime's ability to, to quell them. Well, part of the, another part of the reason why Iranian government is not cracking down or as openly against these demonstrations uh, is also the issue that we, they have with Khamenei. He, we don't know if he's dead or alive. We don't know if he's in coma or is he, uh, because we haven't really heard him lately talking directly about demonstrations, these demonstrations, this is specific demonstrations. And then this is, we're on, we're on day number 13. So I think uh, it looks like, it looks like the IRGC is going to be to have the final say on who is succeeding Khamenei. Khamenei is sick, he's old. He's going to die soon. It, it, it's a matter of time soon, actually. You're not going to see him for the next 10 years in power. So who is going to succeed? IRGC, I think, will say uh, the last word. Had uh, Soleimani uh, didn't die, if he, he was alive today, uh, he would single-handedly pick uh, the successor, and we think he would, he would pick Khamenei's son. But Khamenei's uh, successor is, uh, was going, they were, they were talk about Raisi being possible, one of the possible candidates. Uh, it looks like at this point, he is out. He is, they are not gonna choose him because he has failed in his leadership uh, running the country. He has failed in every aspect of the uh, economic promises he made uh, and he you know, under his leadership Iran is having the largest anti-government demonstration nationwide ethnic wide uh, since the Islamic revolution so this is a problem uh, I, I, I think Iranian government will not be able to recover 100 uh, percent from these demonstrations so they're trying to uh, quell the demonstration with minimum, uh, with minimum uh, loss, if possible, because they know this is this could be the beginning of the end. So, how how can how can these revolutionaries on the streets be assisted by the West? I mean, or by you know, I, I'm sitting in Israel, which we're the little Satan. Uh, what what can we do to help the Iranian people on the ground? How can we help them bring down this regime, which obviously poses an existential threat to Israel? And how um, could the West, if it had any interest in doing so, um, fight uh, or help them fight to bring down this regime that threatens uh, global security as well? I think moral support and giving them a voice, giving them opportunity to express their voice is the best thing that could this government and you know, Western governments can do. Uh, instead of uh, saying good things, they should do good things. Instead of saying we support, they should actually support, not say it. Uh, internet is a major issue. If, if the Western governments come up with some sort of idea, some sort of solution uh, for the people to have access to free internet, accessible internet, where they can upload the, uh, demonstrations, where they can communicate with each other. Uh, that would be a major, major boost. Uh, 
But if, if the Western governments uh, express their support and do nothing, it's actually going to be worse than not saying it. I think they shouldn't say much. They should just do a few things. Uh, giving people voice, covering, covering the demonstrations, you know, keeping everything in, you know, in, in the day-to-day uh, -day thinking of the uh, society in the West. So we, we have to think this way. There will, be, uh, there, there will come times where Western countries or free world should actually step in, do uh, concrete uh, things. And I think we still have time for that. Uh, uh, you know, to happen. But at this point, I think covering the issues and giving them internet and let them fight their own fight is the best way. You know, it, it's, um, it's interesting because uh, it, it, it seems, it's so frustrating to look and see that all of the people who claim to care about human rights and women's rights are the ones really taking a back seat here because um, the actual policies of Western governments right now led by the Biden administration is, is to prolong the life of the Iranian regime through uh, sanctions relief and the, uh, and the nuclear and the nuclear deal that will provide them with up to a trillion dollars by um, 2030. And I guess I have a couple of questions about that. The first one is, you know, if, if the if if Raisi or whoever succeeds him at whatever you know at whatever time um, is able to actually close a deal, decides to close a deal with with the West, with the United States, and billions of dollars start streaming into Iran, will that? Uh, prolong the life of the regime. I mean, is 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 money going to be enough to buy the regime a lifeline? And if so, how would that manifest? If you have any sense, how would that manifest itself? People would suddenly be okay with not having uh, rights because they would that would that work? I mean, could that work? Caroline, we have to understand that this regime, the Iranian regime has had crises every day of its life in the last 42 years, be it uh, in Lebanon, be it in Syria, be it, be it Iran-Iraq war, uh, Afghanistan, Houthis, you know, internally. So this, this regime covers all those internal or its own crises by creating crises somewhere else. So, uh, and that needs money and effort and, and proxies and so forth. Uh, if you if you remember uh, the last time that, that JCPOA was signed, Iran received uh, billions of dollars, I think upwards of $158 billion in cash that was Iran's money sitting in, in foreign banks and they were not able to get it. So they got it overnight. Uh, they also got some, some cash from US government in exchange, for, in exchange for prisoners, to be honest. Uh, during the Obama administration. And then they also had- uh, and They were on pallets, right? The, the yeah, cash pallets that was sent cash. over. Yeah. So then they also were able to sell uh, and buy anything they want. You know, they went on buying sprees, spending sprees and, and selling sprees, oil market and everything was open for them. What happened? All of that money, you know, the government, Iranian government got, uh, two years uh, total budgets, uh, countries budget in one day. What happened? What did they do with that money? They spend, they spend in proxies, they spend in Houthis, Yemen, Syria. They, they, start, they, they continued killing more Syrians in Syria. They, they spent, you know, as, as you may know, Hezbollah leader said one day, they said that our, our undershirt and our underwear is also provided by Iranian government. I mean, he was saying this literally that they get everything from Iranian government. That's our money, that's our people's money. So yes, it, it, it ex expands or extends Iranian government's life because they get money and they spend on proxies to create problems. So focus will be somewhere else, Iranian government will live. And, and Iranian people, in fact, we had a show a couple of years ago, I asked, 
if the, the people want the sanctions relieved. And I just asked a simple question at a live interactive program. We had about, I think, 90 call-ins, and I only, I only took calls from within the country, not from Europe, not from outside the country. Every single person that they called, they said, we want sanctions to, to stay, we want sanctions to be increased, not relieved, not lifted. Because, because their basic, see, their basic concept, just so I understand, they want sanctions because the more the regime is sanctioned, the less it's able to cause mischief abroad and therefore prolong its lifetime. So that yeah. they, they don't see sanctions. Sanctions weakens the government. Sanctions doesn't weaken the people. People are weak already. They have nothing to lose. If, san if sanctions are lifted, like Rouhani's time, people don't get any of those benefits. The government gets it and they spend the way they like. So sanctions is actually good in people's view based on what we call, what we received. We also had, let's say, for instance, uh, we had another show uh, regarding Israel's uh, uh, you know, people's view on Israel. You know, we, I asked simple questions. What's your view? Is Israel our friend or enemy or somewhere in the middle? You know, out of 49 colors, only one person, only one person, and these are all col colors from Iran. They call live our program. I'll send you the link for those programs. One person said Israel could be uh, in the middle, not really friend, but everybody else says Israel is our, our friend. We love Israel. So this means Iran has failed miserably, miserably in their slogans too. Debt to Israel didn't pay off, actually backfired. Uh, debt to America didn't pay off, it backfires. So people want to have a free society where they can say things, they, they have something to say about the government affairs. It doesn't exist. People want to have a better future, economically prosperous future. This government is unable to provide that. This government will not provide it, even if it is able to do it, will not do it because they believe if people get, if middle class gets bigger, middle class is going to start a revolution or anti-revolution in their view. So intentionally, they want people to stay economically weak. Uh, so they, they all are going, so they could just run for a daily uh, bread uh, for their table uh, on a daily basis and not think about anything else. Yes. You know, there, uh, I watched, a, I, I thought a really um, significant interview uh, that Jake Tapper on CNN did, I think this week with Masi Aminajad, uh, the uh, Iranian uh, uh, women's rights activists in Brooklyn that the regime has repeatedly tried to, to assassinate in the United States. Um, and so she was saying, apropos my question to you about, you know, what, what the West can do for, for Iran, for the protesters. And she, she had actually a significant list. I mean, you know, the top of her list, at least from the Israeli perspective, was she said cut off nuclear talks, end them. But she also said she called for Western countries to cut off economic ties and to expel all of the Iranian uh, diplomats from, from their territory. And I think that the basic concept that she was trying to, um, trying to promote here was that it harms the fortunes of the, of the protesters on the streets in Iran when Iran continues to receive legitimacy and be treated as legitimate regime uh, by the nations of the Western world, that what, what they do actually matters, at least in terms of, of giving people hope uh, that they should continue uh, their work to bring down the regime. Um, but you were saying that actually what they, what they do in terms of, uh, or I, I guess you said what they say, but I, I would assume it also means what they do aside from doing things that can actually Make a difference on the ground by, you know, letting having Elon Musk give his uh, satellite cover to Iran to give them access uh, to internet on, on a much wider scale. Um, that there's really uh, very little that Iranians care. They don't care that much what the nations outside of them uh, outside of their borders do, including yeah. well, the West. Looking at this question, is like there are two steps that Western countries should take. One is immediately, that, that's providing internet, covering the events, 
given you know being people's voice because Iran doesn't let internal uh, you know uh, uh, sites and newspapers to be a people's voice. It's basically all those uh, they are basically government's voice, not part. So if one is a longer term. I think Western countries need to. I mean, we're looking at hoping that Iran will have reform. Uh, uh, reformists will come up and then reform this government. I, I think Western countries need to reform their own policies rather than looking for Iranian government to reform. And one of the one of the policies that needs to be reformed is to look at human rights in general. And you know, organizations like like Human Rights Watch is actually indirectly helping the Iranian government by being silent or quiet in very critical times and. You know, only after pressuring these, you know, getting under pressure, they say a few things, you know, and this is demoralizing the, the society in Iran. It's like we have no voice even within the human rights organizations that is basically funded by Western countries. Uh, I agree with Ali Najad. Miss, Miss Ali Najad is right. Iranian uh, government needs to be kicked out of every organization international organizations, including women's rights, you know, in United Nations, including, uh, you know, human rights uh, council, everywhere. Iran cannot be uh, treated as a legitimate government where its president, uh, uh, Raisi, is, is called Ayatollah Qatilov, killer Ayatollah. He, he is one of the three, three members of the, of the killing uh, a group that uh, ordered uh, uh, ordered the uh, uh, about upward of 14,000 civilian uh, fourteen thousand uh, prisoners to be uh, uh, killed, uh, you know, uh, in in I think ni- in late sixties or, or, or late seventies, late eighties. Uh, sorry, I, I'm thinking uh, Iranian uh, calendar Iran versus, versus uh, oh, Western okay. calendar. Yeah. Yes, so. Uh, Late eighties, you know, they killed 40, upwards of fourteen thousand people. And had I stayed in Iran at that time, I would be killed too. I, I, I didn't do much, you know, only because we, 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 you know, people disagreed with the government. Government would just just kill them. So they, they, the idea was like instead of spending money on them keeping them in prison, just kill them. This was one of them. So, yes, yeah, sanctions, n- not not only not to be lifted, sanctions needs to be tightened. Iranian government should not be able to sell oil by any means. We, in the West, uh, we are willing, I think most people are willing to pay more for gas if it helps Iranian people. The problem is that the uh, uh, so-called, again, I'm saying so-called Democrats, I'm not saying just Democratic party, but these so-called Democrats are hoping for Iran to change its course. What's the difference between Iranian government and, let's say, Stalin? Would we be willing to help Stalin to extend its life, the Soviet life, under Stalin's leadership, hoping that they will reform? It's impossible. It's ideological government. This is a theocratic, ideological government that's ha- that set itself within a boundaries that has limits for reform. And those limits are, have all been spent. There is no way that the Iranian government will come back and give women the right. There is no way that they will listen to people. There is no way that they will stop arming or funding terrorist groups worldwide. There's no way that they're, they're going to keep paying attention to people because they, they see people as threat, not their own citizens. They, they see people, if the people are ready, if, they people, if the people have enough food to eat, then they could go out and demonstrate. This is not what they want. They want people to be weak. They want people to just run on a daily basis, hoping that to find a job, maybe find uh, make maybe two dollars a day enough to buy bread and uh, and cheese to survive for tomorrow. That's what the government wants. So I agree with Masi Ali Najat. I, I have two more questions um, for you. Um, 
the first one is, you know, or it's not really a question, I guess it's really the comment that just backs up what you were saying. And one of the analyses that I read of the of the demonstrations this week was that um, you know, that it's very notable that whereas in the past you had uh, reformists uh, within the regime who were part of the protests, you don't see any regime figures at all. You don't even see any clerics at all uh, standing with the the protesters today and that this is really the first time that they've been utterly absent uh, from protests. And um, the, the, the writer was arguing that this shows essentially that uh, this is not this is not about reform that this is about regime change and that this makes the protests a much more revolutionary in character than they've than they've ever been in the past but you know you I, i'm wondering you would take issue with this because you think that it's been going on for some time that the public that opposes the regime publicly you know in in these sorts of protests that they've long since given up the idea that it's possible to, to, to get redress uh, for their grievances against the regime, that they, they don't believe that it's possible. But all the same, that this is something that's, that's very new about these protests. Do you agree that, there, that this is new about these protests? Well, uh, uh, it is, uh, first of all, simply said, yes, I agree. But it goes beyond that. You know, reformists, so-called reformists within the country, within the Iranian regime, are one of the reasons that the regime has extended its life. It's basically, uh, you know, they, they've been, they, they led the country for 16 years, eight years under Khatani, another eight years under Rouhani. And uh, people realize that neither under Khatani nor under Rouhani they were better off from the years before. It is matter of fact that during Rouhani, Iran got the biggest cash and did nothing for the people. Absolutely nothing. And this is fact. It's not opinion. And, and, and people also realize, have realized that these so-called reformists are not, are not actually reformists. If you remember, I don't know if you watched a, a, a videotape of Khatemi, which is the head of the reformist movement, uh, in city of Kirmanshah, he came up uh, you know, years back and said, we don't want a democracy when people were marching for democracy. He said, we don't want a democracy if there is no Islamic law. And this, this, real, I mean, this made people to realize that Khatami is actually not a reformist, true reformist. His reforms. Well, what, I mean, was that at the time when he was also, you know, killing all of the students in the uh, anti uh, in the demonstrations in the universities in 1997-98? After, and this was, I, I think, this was during the so-called uh, Green uh, Movement when Mir Hussein. Oh, so was. it was when he was not in power anymore. Yes, and when he was in power, of course, who killed most of the students? Or well, let's say this. Most of the students were killed under Khatami's leadership. And those students were chanting, long live Khatami. It's not like they were against Khatami, but yet they were killed. And Khatami did nothing, basically. So I think I'm glad that this reformist game, so-called, is over. Iranian government cannot reform itself. And therefore, and reformists, reformists know that. And they also know that they are part of the problem, not part of the solution. Therefore, you don't see any reformists or any, any clergy uh, among people. This is people's revolution or people's uprising. It is not reformists versus anybody else. Reformists are on the other side. Because it, you can't reform this regime. So by definition, it's a lie. You, it, you, you can't be a reformist in this regime because the regime can't reform. It's a lie. It's a lie. It has, I mean, the, 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 look at Soviet Union, Caroline. Soviet Union, when Soviet Union tried to reform itself, didn't succeed. It, had, it, it collapsed. You cannot have an ideological regime and try to reform it. It, it is impossible. So this, the best way is just for this regime to collapse and go. And, and otherwise... What can they do? How, how could they, I mean, those reformers or those think that Iran could be reformed, they should think 
what part, what segment of this policy, this government's policy can be reformed? For instance, economically, no way. Politically, no way. Democratically, impossible. So this is a ideological regime that will continue on cracking down on people until the end. And, th and that brings me to my last question, which is, you know, you said you don't, you're not, you don't really think that this, uh, that the current protests are going to lead to the downfall of the regime. But on the other hand, you know, you, you think that it's, um, that it's, uh, that it's possible to bring down the regime and that eventually the regime will be brought down. So why, what gives you hope that it can happen? What gives you a reason to believe that despite your, your, your better, you know, you, 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 despite your instincts that actually it might happen, it could happen now. What, what is it about what's happening on the ground that you think that it has potential to really uh, be revolutionary, that this revolutionary movement actually is going to be a successful one and bring down the, the regime in Iran? Well, number one is this regime is coming to end of its life. Realistically, is not able to, uh, to fool people anymore. If you look at the trend, look at the past 42 years, Khomeini came to power heavy-handedly. Then the Iran-Iraq war happened. Eight years of war, we understand. Actually, that was the biggest, biggest gift to the government because that helped the government stabilize itself using nationalism to fight Iraq versus Iranian uh, policies, government policies. Then uh, Rafsanjani came to power. Rafsanjani tried to ease uh, some restrictions and uh, uh, tried to basically uh, simply said, fool people. And that didn't happen. People were still upset. Khatami came, as they call it, through reformists. They call it, and we, and we don't think he was reformist. But, well, nothing happened, really. Then they went back to a little bit more heavy-handed Ahmadinejad. Ahmadinejad was a uh, Khamenei's crony, basically. But towards the end of his own administration, he had a problem with Khamenei himself. That didn't help. Then they, they thought, okay, let's, let's pick somebody in the middle, as they call it, moderate Rouhani. Eight years, JCPOA was signed. Iran got money. Iran opened all the doors and windows to the world. Nothing happened to the people. Not, people didn't get any benefit. Now they're out of options. So now they went back to the beginning. Raisi and Khomeini has, Khomeini has basically the same policies. So this is a Islamic, Islamic government uh, republic starting from 42 years ago, again. So they're out of option. That's number one. Number two, the demonstrations are widespread. All the segments of society is involved one way or the other. Everybody is tired, basically, of Iran's, Iranian government's lies and, and basically empty promises. They know it's not going to happen. You know, whatever they say, is they're not going to do it if, if they don't, if, they, if it doesn't benefit the government itself, nothing will happen. And number three, if you realize this is, we're going on week number two, day number 13, and this is continuing. Again, I'm not right, saying- We're, we're is, taping this show just for you guys to know, we're taping it on Thursday, uh, September 29th. So, you know, it will be well into the second week or third week, actually, of the protests by the time this comes up, unless they're quelled, God forbid. And, and today on September 29th, we are sitting and looking at day number 13, demonstrations are continuing. Uh, this has never happened before. Uh, so again, I'm not saying this is the end of the regime, but it is possible. It is possible. If demonstrations take place or uh, start in Iraq, which we expect, that is going to happen, uh, that will be against Iran also. So, so Iran cannot bring Hashtar Shabi or militia from Iraq to help its, uh, its police, then, uh, then this could be a 
real problem for Iranian government. As it is, it's a problem. It's not the biggest problem, but it is a big problem. Iraq joins in, then the problem gets bigger. If the demonstrations in Iran continues, it gets bigger. Again, it's totally- Maybe Lebanon could join in, maybe the Lebanese might join in against Hezbollah. The Lebanese know. against Hezbollah might join in, then it's a pro bigger problem. So this could uh, actually end up being the end of the government or beginning of the end of the government. It's not there yet, but it is possible. All right, well, I think we're gonna leave it there on that hopeful note um, that uh, you know we'll see this evil regime destroyed uh, by its own people uh, who have been its primary victims all along. Um, you know, uh, Ahmed, uh, I, Ahmed Oban, I, I appreciate so much that you came on board and I wish you the best of luck. Are you getting any, by the way, just last thing on your broadcast into Iran, are you getting feedback from call-in shows at all over the past two couple of weeks? And if so, what, what has sort of been the main character of these things? Not Collins, Caroline, as you uh, know, oh, Iran is, uh, is preventing calls. Iran is uh, shutting down internet on certain time of the day, usually between- And satellite uh, broadcasts as well, they don't see, so you're not- Satellite you know, broadcasts, satellite. they see us. They're not able to jam the, they're not jamming the uh, satellites, but they are, people are watching us. They are sending us files of demonstrations, pictures, uh, news. They're finding ways to send us pro, uh, you know, uh, news on a daily, hourly basis. So we're in touch directly with them. And the sense that you get is that people think that these are very serious protests. It is, it is yeah, it is, it, it is very serious, especially young people are just like what the Egyptians do in, uh, in Tahrir Square in, in Cairo. People are starting uh, to think that they shouldn't go home and leave the streets, they may not be able to come back. So therefore some, some areas of the cities uh, are continuously, I'm not saying occupied, but busy, but they also you, you, in Iran, in big cities, people are starting from different locations. So it's not one specific location like uh, in Egypt, in Cairo was Tahrir Square. Here we have different part of the uh, cities, large cities where the police or, or IRGC members cannot crack down really easy, really fast. So they have to spread themselves as well. So this is a good, good uh, tactic that people are using. All right, well, well Ahmed Obai, thank you so much for enlightening me and all of uh, our audience uh, with what's going on in Iran. And again, you know, we, we, we wish only the best uh, and our prayers are with the Iranian people and that they should that they should be able to meet with success and gain their freedom and free the entire world of this dangerous terrorist regime. So thank you very much and, and God bless you and your viewers and, and please extend our greetings to them as well. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.